Hello, and welcome to today's virtual Commonwealth Club World Affairs Program. My name is Tani Cantil Sakuwe, President and CEO of the Public Policy Institute of California. It is my pleasure to introduce today's guest, former United States Supreme Court Associate Justice Stephen Breyer. Justice Breyer served 28 years on the United States Supreme Court before retiring in 2022. He is the Byrne Professor of Administration and Law and Process at Harvard Law School and author of Reading the Constitution, Why I Chose Pragmatism, Not Textualism. And as a reminder to our audience, we will be taking your questions and encourage you to submit them in the YouTube chat. Justice Breyer, warm welcome to you, sir. Uh, let me start off by asking you, what inspired you to write a book about statutory and constitutional interpretation now? Well, first, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. And uh, I you're lucky to be in California. Sacramento isn't bad. In San Francisco, that's where I was born. Of course, it's even better. <laughs> Don't say I said that, but it's the truth. Why write this book? Well, first, I think you have lawyers and non-lawyers, and particularly when I talk to the fifth graders. Are they interested in law? Nah, maybe. <laughs> but I want to tell them, what is it that a Supreme Court justice uh, or a court of appeals judge much of the time. What do they do? What's the job? And I found a perfect example in a French newspaper where a biology professor was traveling from Nantes to Paris. And he had a basket down on the side of his seat and the conductor came up and said, what's in the basket? Looked and there were 20 live snails. Well, said the conductor, do you have a ticket for the snails? What? said the professor, a ticket for the snails. Well, look here, says the conductor. It says right in the fare book, you see, right here. It says no animals on the train unless they're in a basket. And then you have to pay half fare for the snail, for the basket, for the animals. And the teacher says, that's ridiculous. He says, absolutely ridiculous. They mean cats and dogs, maybe a rabbit, but certainly not a snail. They don't mean a mosquito, do they? I mean, or a horse fly or something. It's ridiculous. Well, he says, is a snail an animal? Yes or no? And it says animals. So I say to the class, well, what do you think? Is a snail an animal? Does he have to pay? And that's perfect because then they get into the most horrendous argument you've ever seen. Some say, of course it's an animal. A snail is an animal. No, no, they don't mean mosquitoes, do they? Or, 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 and I don't have to say anything. I can just leave. I said, perfect. And, and uh, I say, that's what judges do. Now, I mean the appellate judges, not snails, maybe that word isn't there. Maybe the words are the freedom of speech. Or maybe the words are keep and bear arms. But, same idea, what do those words mean in this context? How do they apply? All right, now do you see the job. All right, but since I was in law school, uh, roughly speaking, you can go back to Chief Justice John Marshall years ago and uh, 200 years ago, more. And, and there were ways of sort of finding out. You'd read the, what it says, read what it says. You know, if the words in that text, suppose the word is carrot. Carrot does not mean fish. You can't get around that fact. <laughs> so you better work with carrot, not fish. All right, but rarely in the Supreme Court particularly, rarely does it give you a total answer. And so you look to other things. What people used to look to a lot was someone wrote those words, didn't they? Probably in Congress or maybe the founders. What did they have in mind? What were they trying to achieve? What was the mischief they were after? And by the way, if we interpret it this way or this way, what are the consequences? Are they consequences that fit with the purpose or not? Or what's the value? The value, what do I mean by value? I mean this document here. This document here is filled with values. This tells us that we will be, this is the Constitution, by the way, in case you can't see it, but it tells us that we're going to be a democracy, certain human rights protected, equality, 
rule of law, separation of powers. There are values in this document. Maybe look to that too. And Marshall, John Marshall, I wrote it down. I thought it was so good. I, I put it in the book. But uh, he said, where the mind labors to discover the design of the legislature in those words, it seizes everything from which aid can be derived. Well, when I was a law student, that's how I was brought up when I wasn't talking to my friends in class. No, but, but I mean, uh, you see, that was Hart and Sachs, the professors here, uh, and they had a lot. We can go into that later if you want. But now suddenly a new thing has come along, a new thing, a new thing, a new thing which I'm not fond of. <laughs> and that new thing is just read the text. Just read the text. And for originalism, it's just read the text and interpret it as it was a, nor a reasonable person would have interpreted it, oh, 200 years ago or so when they wrote it. Nino Scalia, who was a good friend, who was my colleague on the court, he says he's a textualist. We look for meaning in the governing text. We say it means what, it, what they meant when it was written. And we reject any speculation about purposes or consequences. Stay away from those. And they make some promises. One, we promise if you follow what we say, you will see that it's simple and clear and just one answer. Congress will find it easier to write statutes. The words will mean the same thing all over the country. That's fair and most important, we will stop those judges from putting in interpretation what they think is good instead of what the law requires. Okay? Now, is that what I followed the 28 years when I was a judge? Some judges said we're all textualists now. I'm not a textualist. No, I didn't follow it one little bit. I thought it was a very bad idea. A very bad idea, and I can give you examples as to why it's such a bad idea, and it won't work, and the promises won't be kept. So let's go back to purposes, consequences, etc. And I want people to understand that. Why? Because there are an awful lot of people, when they don't like the decisions of the Supreme Court, they go around saying, oh, it's just politics. The court is just politics. Or, that court just does whatever the judges just like, instead of the law. I say, no, that's wrong. That's not my experience. That isn't true. It isn't just politics. It isn't just doing what you want. No, absolutely not. And I want them to understand how we decide something, what we do. And then when they understand it, if they're prepared to agree with me that this textualism is a really bad idea, then fine. And if they don't agree, they don't agree. That's up to them. But they can read about it and understand what it is. Now, that's a long answer, but that is why I wrote the book. I think when you unpack that answer, it really does a service to the United States and to democracy to explain uh, to young people, including fifth graders and frankly, longtime judges and experienced lawyers, how the court works, why it works the way it does, the judicial philosophies, as well as you've pointed out, in order to, in order to demystify this branch of government that's doing its job, I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, how it is uh, you are, came to practice uh, pragmatism and not textualism. And, and can you break down, just for our non-legal audience, a little bit more the difference between pragmatism and textualism? And as you point out in your book, it's cousin originalism. Well, probably, because when I went to law school, which is, it wasn't as many believe in the Middle Ages or, or maybe in the dark ages of, or so I, no, it was more recent than that. But my professors were mostly, uh, of, uh, and they quoted Holmes, Brandeis, Cardoza, Chief Justice John Marshall, and others who basically would ask, what's this, what is this language in this statute? We don't know what it means, but what's it doing here? Somebody wrote it, they had an idea, they had a purpose. I'll give you an example. Okay, now did you know, you probably did, a lot of people do know or realize, but if you have a handicapped child, you can go to the school board and say you must, under the law, give that child an appropriate education, a good education. And suppose you think they're not doing their job. You can sue them, the school board, in a federal court. And suppose you win. Well, they have to change but the, the system. But 
If you win, it says right in the statute, you are entitled to your costs. So the woman in the case said, you know what the cost of the educational expert was? $29,000, which is a lot of money then, and it still is. <laughs> All right, $29,000, which I don't have. I would like that as part of my costs. Now, does cost include the educational expert, or does it just mean like legal parts of it? Huh. Now, the textualist tells us, well, go and read the text. Okay, try it. You read C-O-S-T-S, and what's the word? I'm asking you. Cost. Okay, now let's read it twice. C-O-S-T-S, C-O-S-T-S. Now what does it say? Yes, now let's try it three times. Okay, cost, cost, cost. Okay, hey, hey, did that give me the answer? No, it did not give me the answer. And there are lots of cases like that. I mean, uh, did you know you can sue the government officials for all kinds of things and collect money if they were wrong? Uh, they committed a tort or something. But there's some exceptions. Some people you can't sue. And in those exceptions, you cannot sue for property a, uh, a customs and excise officer. All right, have you got that? You can't sue a customs and excise officer or any other law enforcement officer. Now, who is another law enforcement officer? Uh, a German policeman? That doesn't tell us much. A traffic cop? A regular policeman? Or just, so, there are about 100,000 of those. Or just somebody who is associated with customs and excise. Which does it mean? A customs and excise law enforcement officer or a regular law enforcement officer? Which does it mean? Try the same game. Let's three, four times. What are you going to learn? Nothing. Okay? We're going to learn nothing from saying those words 10 times. And uh, I, there's more to it than that, but I, I deal with that in the book. And uh, what should you do? I say, hey, somebody wrote these words over in the Congress. Find out who, find out why, find out what they were doing. Did they really intend to make 100,000 policemen immune, or did they just intend to make a handful of uh, law enforcement officers associated with customs and excise? I say, we can find out if we look to purposes. We can find out, maybe, if we look to consequences. We can find out if we look to what's going to happen. We cannot find out by repeating those words any other law enforcement officer 58,000 times. And there are a few other things they'll look at that are semantic, they're linguistic. They won't help either. Okay, now do you see? You see why? I say, hey, try the cousin. You want the cousin? The cousin's originalism. It says, interpret the word as to what a reasonable person would have meant when it was written. When was the Constitution written? You're excused if you don't know the dates but it's around 1787, 88, 89. So what would a reasonable person have thought keep and bear arms means then? Or some of the Constitution is very important, was written in 1870 after the Civil War. What would a person have thought then? And don't look at anything else. Oh, please, really? I don't look at anything else? I don't look at values, for example? I don't look at consequences? Really? Don't look at anything else. Hmm. I'll tell you something about You want to know one interesting thing that might interest you? About 1788, let's look at the uh, political community in the United States in 1788-89. It seems to me there were some people missing. Let's guess who was missing. Who? I was missing. Yes, you were. You were, and, you, and women were missing, and slaves were missing, and a lot of Indians were missing. I mean, there were an awful lot of people missing then, and that's what's going to be the absolute, well, that isn't such a great thing. And you want a little bit more than that? Go look at the gun case. The gun case is supposed to work that New York cannot pass a law that says you cannot carry concealed and sometimes open a gun. Why not? Because people went around carrying guns in 1788? Because we should look at the history of guns? Or I tried it for a few minutes. I, I really looked at the history of guns. I got my law clerks to get the, 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 the Hundred Years' War, a pretty good book, The History of the Hundred Years' War, written by a judge in England, uh, Assumption, and uh, I, five volumes if you need sleep. All right, but in any case, it's a pretty good book. And uh, they, had gu they had weapons in there like a haldebard, a haldebard, uh, a uh, stillikin, uh, uh, along with a dirk, and along with Asian fire, which you threw over the 
ceiling of the, of the you threw over the wall to burn everybody up on the inside. I see, oh, okay, I got it. What I'm supposed to do, according to the majority, is I should find out what a Haldabard is and find out what a Stilicon is or a, a, or Asian fire or something, and then see if that's analogous, if they allowed it then, which they seem to have done, if that's analogous to New York. You know, New York saying you can't carry a uh, hidden can, or uh, openly either uh, a revolver. I mean, please, I'm not a historian. And if I were a historian, I don't think I still would know what a Haldabard was, but they'd know better than me. And uh, we can't decide cases that way. And you tell me not to look at a few things I think are awfully relevant. We have 400 million guns in the United States. We are number one. Yemen, I think, is number two. And go look at the number of spouses who are killed or hurt through spousal abuse with guns. And go look at the number of policemen who are killed. And go look at the number of mass shootings. My goodness, mass shootings didn't even begin, I think, for 50 years ago. But boy, they've taken it up. And there are people all over the place dead. And so I said, of course I want to look at that. Because this statute is designed to minimize, to cut down, to stop, if likely, some of those shootings. And do I think that's relevant? Of course I think it's relevant. It is part of what law is there for. And that's what I learned to go back to your original question, Hart and Sachs, what they said. Law is there. It is a human instrument. For what? A human instrument so that we in the United States, you know, we have 320, 330 million people, every race, every religion, every point of view possible, and we live together. And it is to help those people live together, live together peacefully, and we hope more prosperously. And so keep that up and look at these other things. And they often, not always, but they often will help you interpret some very obscure words in a statute. And if you think it's easy, if you think this job is easy interpreting those words, I have a bridge in Manhattan to sell you. I think you've really pointed out uh, that how Bruin could have come out entirely different as you've described were the majority of the United States Supreme Court to take a more pragmatic view of the interpretation of the New York statute. And I was interested in not only in your history, but in this book, when you talk about the reasonable legislator value. And I wondered if, I, went, I thought maybe you'd talk a little bit about that and whether any of that came from your time when you worked for Senator Kennedy. Yes, yes, I can't say every legislator is reasonable all the time. And I can't say every staff person, including me, is reasonable all the time. But Kennedy did say, with people he disagreed with, he said, we disagree a lot. But where we agree is the people in this Senate and in the Congress and in public life, at some level, have an idea they're there to help America. And they have different ideas about how and what will help America. But there is a public-spirited vein running there. And you say, go back and look at a reasonable legislator. That's because you can't always tell. We used to write reports. We would write reports explaining what the statute was about. We would circulate the reports to every member of the Judiciary Committee. Any staff person who thought his boss might disagree uh, would go to the boss and say, should we write a dissent? And they would write a dissent. And uh, very often, not always, but very often, those staff reports would tell you what this was about, what they were trying to do, why they wrote these words rather than some others. Not always, not always, but often. And therefore, reading that could ha help you get an idea of what's going on. And that's really what you want to know. Because the members of Congress, they're connected with the people of the United States through election. And if they try too hard to hurt people instead of helping people, they won't be in office anymore. And so they have something springing from their constituents or what would be reasonable. And, and a judge should try to interpret that statute so it works. You can't always, but you try. And that's what I think is going on behind what's going on be other than that, behind those robes and those secret rooms, nothing, nothing. They're talking to each other. They're trying to work out how others see the statute. In that conference room where we go and discuss the week's cases, I have never 
in 28 years heard a voice raised in anger. I have never in 28 years heard one judge say of another judge on that court something mean, something, even as a joke, something spiteful or, or nasty. It just doesn't happen. They're professional. They listen to each other. If they don't listen to each other, you can learn pretty quickly. If you don't listen to what other people say, you're going to get nowhere. So listen and say something not, ha, 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 I have a better argument than you. Try that one. Ha, 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 I have a better argument than you. Before I got out the second ha, they stopped listening. Good okay. points. In mm -hmm. fact, today you are a guest opinion writer in the New York Times about how you've gotten along with your colleagues. A great article. And it sort of coincides with a question in our chat where I, a viewer asks, do you still keep in touch with your colleagues on the court? Yes, I do somewhat. I mean, I, I go down there. I have an office down there. Uh, it used to be Sandra O'Connor's when she retired. And, uh, and I have an assistant. And, and I'll be down there maybe one week in three or a few days every three weeks or so. As I, I write some of my book there or I might speak to a group or there, there are things going on. But I don't take part in the cases. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you about um, your time on as a jurist, not only 28 years on the United States Supreme Court, but 14 mm -hmm. years as a federal appeals judge. And my question is, has textualism always been part of jurists' philosophy? Or is this no. a newer phenomenon? And what is it? When did it come no. about? Why? I don't know. You better ask the textualist. I, I will not have a good answer to that question, but I think I'll show you. I think it's uh, fairly new, 21st century. And um, I think maybe one of the things, this is just a guess, but they thought judges, particularly in the Supreme Court, were making up too many things that they thought was good, were good instead of what the statute said or the Constitution said. But I'll say, look, you think that's your fourth promise, by the way. The first promise disappeared as soon as we started looking at a few of the cases. It isn't clear. It isn't obvious. It isn't so, it isn't you're going to get the same answer anywhere, everywhere. Please, spare me. Just look at a few of the cases which are in this book, and, and there are others beside, and, and you'll see whether you don't agree on that. But what about this fourth thing that was so important? The thing that, well, we'll stop the judges from just making up what they want. And that's something judges try not to do. It's, it's not that they're doing politics. It, politics, when I work for Senator Kennedy here, well, here's a question for you. The phone rings in Senator Kennedy's office. One call immediately is from the Secretary of Defense. One call is from the mayor of Worcester. Which will he speak to first, in your opinion? Worcester. Yeah, of course. Because you know <laughs> politics. <laughs> that's, where, but that's where the politics is. The mayor of Worcester, a bunch of constituents. Okay. Uh, and did I, could I get all the Republicans and Democrats to come to an executive session of the Judiciary Committee? I tried, but politics is in that too. Vote yes, vote no, which is popular, which isn't, which will the press pick up, which will they not? That's politics. I don't see that on the Supreme Court. What I see, in, if there's a vacancy, is there are groups really involved in politics. And they try to get the president or the Senate to favor Judge X because they think Judge X has a judicial philosophy that will lead Judge X to decide the way they want politically. And they're sometimes right, sometimes wrong. But that is not politics. What you actually see, one, you see the judge, who maybe these political people help get appointed, but the judge thinks he's deciding according to the right way of going about legally deciding a case. Two. Sometimes the judge has hmm, political philosophy, which sounds a lot like politics, what the country is like, but it isn't really politics. Three, the judge has grown up somewhere, hasn't he? I grew up in San Francisco. Are you in San Francisco now? No, I don't forget where you were. You might be in Sacramento. You're close, okay. Well, then you know San Francisco, Lowell High School. This is my father's watch public high school. My father was, it says SFUSD, San Francisco Unified School District. That's how I grew up. I went to Stanford. All of us are like that. We have, by the time we're in our 40s or 50s, views, perhaps growing out of our childhood, perhaps growing out of our experiences, views. What's the country like? What's our discipline like? 
How do I do my job well? What's a good job? What's a good way of doing it? We all have that. We can't prevent that from entering our decision making. You can't. You can try. And I think most judges do try, but it seeps in. It seeps in. That's not politics. That's called you can't jump out of your skin. Four, the, all right, the way that politics really does work was best expressed by Paul Freund, who's a great professor here at Harvard. And he said, no judge, no judge decides a case according to the temperature of the day. He means the political temperature of the day. I mean, if you do that, suppose you're very unpopular. You wouldn't want to be tried by a judge who's going to have to, you know, be political or lose his office or something. I mean, terrible. OK, the least popular person is entitled to the same fair trial as the most. But, added Freud, no judge is moved or should be moved by the temperature of the day, but every judge is likely moved by the climate of the season. You see what I'm saying? I mean, the New Deal judges grew up at a time when there was a depression, not tremendous growth. The Lochner judges in 1900 and so, there was huge economic growth, and they thought we better save the country. Uh, goose better continue laying golden egg by the Roosevelt period, no golden egg, not there, 24% unemployment. And so not surprisingly, the country did change its political climate and judges are not immune from that. So that's a fourth thing. And people could confuse that with the t telephone call from Worcester, but it's not. And sometimes there's what I call pretty close to real politics. The court had to enforce Brown versus Board of Education. Why? Congress didn't help them. The president really didn't help them. Ah, and Frankfurter told them on one case involving miscegenation, don't decide that now. The South has already got every bare space filled with impeach Earl Warren, and they just won't do what we tell them. Let's wait. And so they waited, and they decided that eventually in favor of the civil liberty side, but it was some time later. Okay, see, they postponed it because they were worried about reactions. And uh, there is a f another thing, a sixth thing, which I don't know if I can explain, but if you want to read it. It's, uh, it's in uh, Taft, wrote, uh, who was a great, uh, he was a good chief justice and he was president of the United States uh, before. And uh, he wrote a letter to Justice Sutherland and he said, I, of course I want a judge appointed who knows something about the law. It's a legal job after all. But I also want him to know something about what he called the higher politics. Now, what did he have in mind by that? Well, the Supreme Court, unlike other courts, perhaps, is really one of the three parts of government and really has a role there. And so, to some degree, that comes in, sometimes. And if you think you can explain it better than that, you may be able to, because <laughs> I can't explain it too well. I call it the X factor. That's to explain that I can't have a good way of describing it. But Taft did, and he explained it pretty well. So now we've got six different things, and none of them is the equivalent of the telephone call from Worcester. You've explained it very well, and you've explained the practicality of it as well when you talk about the miscegenation case that came after Brown versus Board. I wonder that today, for people and journalists who haven't read your book, and we hear so much about uh, the attacks on the judiciary as being political, um, whether or not you will speak or have anything to say about how the public received the Dobbs decision and or the, San, uh, the Students for Fair Admissions? Well, there, there are different cases, but Dobbs was where they overturned Roe v. Wade and overturned Casey v. Polino and decided that those two precedents, which stood for a woman's right to have an abortion, were no longer good law. Now, three of us wrote a dissent, a pretty, pretty tough dissent. Uh, you know, strong, uh, uh, Justices Kagan, Sotomayor, and myself. And I would, to answer you, take one, only one aspect. We had a lot of arguments in that dissent, I promise you, quite a few. But uh, let me take one of them. Do you remember when I talked about four promises? Yeah. And do you remember the fourth promise? We will stop those wishy-washy judges from substituting what they think is good for what the law requires. All right, thank you, Mr. Textualist. I've got the promise. I see what you're saying. Could I show you a case, please? I'd like to show you Dobbs. And in Dobbs, you overruled 
two earlier cases. Overruling is rare. Rare. You have to be careful. There's a principle called stare decisis, which really means don't overrule cases very much, even if you think they're wrong. Don't do it, because otherwise the law becomes too unstable. Okay. You got all that in mind. I knew you knew that. Now, what's your basis for overruling an earlier case? Will you overrule or say you might overrule an earlier case that didn't decide according to originalism because they used the wrong system, in your view, or didn't use textualism? No. Why will you not use that as a way of overruling them? Why? Because that's every case. That's just about every case. And if we overruled every case that didn't use textualism or didn't use originalism, we wouldn't have any law left. How could you run the country? How could you? I mean, you're not going to say that, and they won't. Say, oh, I see. You mean you're going to overrule those cases that are really wrong, were really wrongly decided. Yeah, mm -hmm. I get it. And by the way, who is it who's going to decide whether they were really wrongly decided? A judge. Ah, maybe you. And there doesn't seem to be a mechanical rule on that, is there? You're just going to think to yourself, they're really wrongly decided. Ah, and give some reasons. Doesn't that sound an awful lot? Like that way of deciding cases that ordinary judges had for 200 years and you've just criticized? And how are you going to cure that with your textualism and originalism when it's open to the same problem? when it's open to the same problem of you picking out cases to overrule on the basis you think they're really wrong. Mm -hmm. I get it. So now we're finished all four promises, and all four promises, in my opinion, in this book's opinion, which is a coincidence because it's also mine, <laughs> uh, 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 no, it won't work. You can't keep the promises. And so what's the point of following a system such as textualism, originalism, which can't keep its four major promises and which can lead to a lot of wrong results. It's very interesting to hear that because, um, of, of course, it explains, it, it points out the, the flaw, as you note, in textualism and originalism, which is one of the bases, as you pointed out, is to restrain judges from imposing their good judgment on something when you, you, when you use stare decisis in a way, when you violate stare decisis, it's essentially the same kind of, uh, same result. So we have a few questions in the chat, which kind of speaks to your earlier answer on, uh, on the politics issue of judicial decisions. And it's a question that asks if you could comment on the November 2023 Code of Conduct for SCOTUS, and do you believe that it goes far enough? Well, I've always used, so there's a code of conduct, I think with seven volumes for all federal judges. Might, maybe it's six, I don't know. But they, they've worked on it a long time, many, many years. And it's in the court. And every time I had a difficult case, I'd read it, the relevant part, and see what it said and try to follow it. Now, you can't 100% as easily as in a lower court, you see, because if you are disqualified or think you might be disqualified, but you're not sure in the lower court, <laughs> Take yourself out of the case. They'll put in another judge. No problem. In the Supreme Court, you do that, there's no one to put in. And because there's no one to put in, hmm, maybe the result will change. And you don't want to give people a weapon to try to change the result by changing the bench. Not there. And so you have to be, that just means you have to be careful. It just means you have to be careful, think about it, talk to your colleagues, many times you do. And if I had something that I thought was really difficult, I would call a legal expert, you know, somebody who teaches ethics at one of the universities and say, what do you think? And try to gather the information. And then, having read the, the, uh, the, the, having read the relevant documents, which is the code of conduct for all federal judges, um, it I think prevents me from reading it, and I think my colleagues do the same, or talk to the others, see what they think, talk to some of the experts, I decide what to do, okay? And I know there's in the paper, they say, oh, well, you can't enforce it. You can't enforce it for any judge. Judges say the Constitution served during good behavior, and the way to remove a judge, any judge in the federal system, is you go to uh, uh, Congress and get them impeached. That's the people with the power. Uh, but uh, I, we did have, while I was in the First Circuit, we had two cases. There are an awful lot of cases that aren't, you know, people make complaints, which they're free to do, and really bounced a, 
not an ethical problem. But there were two that I thought were pretty serious. And so what I did, I was chief judge then, so, was, so I, I appointed a lawyer, a good lawyer in Boston, and uh, they looked into each case uh, in some depth, and then we went down and had a hearing. Or we, and in one case, I wrote a letter of uh, a letter that, that criticized the judge for what he had done. I think probably apologized. I don't remember later. Uh, it, it wasn't obvious, you know. It wasn't the other. The 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 individual resigned. Uh, so I think it's not true. There's nothing you could do. Uh, I think it's not true that there is no code. There is a code. Maybe it doesn't call itself a Supreme Court code, but. Those seven volumes are there, and I did look at them. So I probably uh, believe that this is less of an immediate problem than many think. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying who's right. You wanted my opinion. That's my opinion. <laughs> no, I, hearing from an expert. And I think it, uh, that has some ties a little bit to, I think, the need for judicial independence. It does. It does. See, see that's the problem. That's the problem. You don't want somebody telling someone on the Supreme Court. It, judicial independence. Look, you know, the best thing I heard, one of the really good things I heard said about that was um, Tony Kennedy. We were at a dinner, and it was a long time ago. It was just after the Iron Curtain fell. And we had a group of judges there, a few of them from Russia. And they were talking about judicial decision making. And Tony said this. He said, um, you know, you can do your best to decide independently. Will the parties know if you're right? No. I mean, maybe they will, but everybody expects the winning lawyer to say what a genius you are and the losing lawyer to say privately, at least, he thinks you're a total idiot. And so, so, so therefore, you're not going to get very far with that. And what is there to say whether you've been true to the record? whether you've been honest in the words that you wrote. Who is it who knows? You know. Nobody else. Nobody else will know. They'll have different motives, they'll have different da 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 but you will know. And we know in respect to that and in respect to you what it's like trying to make what we would call that honest decision. And we know that it's tough. That's the pressure. The pressure is not to get your name in the newspaper. Please, spare me. A president said this to me. He said, the applause dies away fast. And you're left with a job. And you better like it. And the virtue of that job is it does give you a chance to do your best. It gives you a chance to try to do your best to make it honest. It does, gives you a chance to try to put what you have, whatever virtues you have, put it into that opinion. Because you don't say any more than a doctor says, oh, this is a case I've seen so much before, forget it. No doctor says such a thing. And no judge says such a thing. Indeed. You put your best. And that is a privilege. That is a privilege to doing that. I'm trying to give you a picture. I'm trying to give you a picture of of course, a person can be not honest, but if you're not going to be honest, why be a judge? There are other jobs. Right. Well, so well said. And, and in my view, the vetting process to become a jurist, particularly one uh, at your level, m means that um, all the front lifting, the heavy load, the heavy interviews and the inquiries have been done to ensure that this person is going to do the right thing and not for politics or name. And so that leads me to a question that's been in the chat, but also just one of the same as my interest. From in your, you've talked a little bit about your first day, week, months, years as a Supreme Court justice. And so I was hoping you could address what that felt like. And then 28 years later, having the experience of being able to look back and say, this is what I would change, if anything. You don't know. I mean, I know this, and Sandra O'Connor used to say this, and David Souter said it takes three or five years before you adjust to the job, and William O. Douglas said about the same thing. And why? Because you thought you could do the job. Yeah, but suddenly you're there. And you think to yourself without telling anybody else, geez, I hope I can. And it's not that easy. And you would like to do it correctly. 
and you walk around fairly nervous for a few years. But gradually you learn, you learn what people have done in the past, you learn from your colleagues, you learn during the conferences, you learn by, through the opinions, you learn, you learn, you learn. And you end up after three or four or five years saying, well, I'll probably never do it perfectly, but I, I can do my best. And that's the best I can do. And that's really what happens. And that's why I think at the end of this book, I think eventually this extreme textualism, originalism, it's going to disappear because people will discover over time it doesn't work very well. And that it isn't such a terrible thing to go and try and find out what was the mischief that led to this statute? Why did they write it this way? How do we write a constitutional decision that keeps in touch with what people want to call the spirit, but you can say the values that underlie it? And that's also a reason why I worry if I'm wrong and textualism sort of takes over. Why do I worry? Because I think, and I've tried to write enough to show why I think this here, it's not just theory. It's that I think in individual cases, and that's why I have a lot. I have about five or six or seven tough statutory cases illustrating different kinds of things. And I have constitutional cases too. And what I fear is they will be decided less well from the point of view of getting results that help Americans live together as a community more safely and productively too, we hope, under the values that this document sets forward. And if they can't, well, then what happens to the rule of law? Do they decide it isn't worth it? Do they decide we don't like going along with cases that we don't agree with? Hmm. Hmm. Other countries have tried that. How well does that work? You see? You see the kinds of things? And in and, and the book that I quote to the students all the time, do you, do you want me to keep on telling you that this book? Not this book. Albert Camus, read it. The plague. The plague. Hmm. He's writing about a plague that took over Oran in Algeria. But he's really writing about the Nazis taking over France. And at the end, he says, why did I write this book? He says, I wrote it because I wanted you to see how the people of Oran, namely France, how they reacted, some well, some badly, some helped, some didn't, all kinds of ways. And I also wrote it because I wanted you to see what the hero who's a doctor, what a doctor does. A doctor is a person who helps. He helps without having a philosophy. He needn't have one. He just helps. And I wrote it because, and he said, oh, this is great. I like this to tell to the law students at least. I wrote it because the plague germ, because in French it's the basilus de la peste. The plague germ never dies. It's there in each one of us. It goes into remission. It lurks. It lurks in the attics. It lurks in the hallways. It lurks in the file cabinets. For one day, to the detriment or the education of a city, it will release its rats once again into a once happy town. All right? I say the rule of law is one weapon, not the only weapon. But it is one weapon that human beings have developed to keep that basilisk to the past, that plague germ, in the attic, or keep it somewhere away from us, or do our best to see it doesn't come out. And uh, it's pretty important, as I say, not the only weapon, but it's one important weapon to make certain that people can live together decently, even though they disagree. Mm -hmm. You've uh, uh, pointedly expressed why our constitution talks about it is a document and a government for the people and by the people and uh, a pragmatism interpretive approach gives gives illuminates and forms that promise there are some questions in the chat that i'd like to get to before our time runs these are our audience members and i ask you what is the best part of being a justice and what is the most challenging? And you've sort of described these, but um, how about that question? 
It's similar, probably, probably the best part is, I'll tell you what isn't the best part. I mean, what I said before, that you get some recognition or as people say how wonderful you are. I went to a reception for young law students and one of them comes up and says, oh, Justice Breyer, you write such wonderful opinions. I really love them. Would you mind signing my program? So I sign his program. As he walks away, he turns to his friend and he says, that makes four. You see the point? Yeah, we understand that. So the best part is really, it's really the cases. The people are fine, they're nice, we get on well. Uh, they have a sense of humor. And uh, when we're in the conference, uh, we're deciding we're doing business. We are deciding these cases and we listen. Uh, we don't always listen perfectly, we should, but we don't always. And uh, trying to get these cases which are very, very difficult and trying to get an answer that is among the better answers. That is a challenge. And to spend a long part of your life under the needs demanded by a better challenge, that is a privilege. And it's a little serious to say that, but it's true. Mm -hmm. No, I, uh, to that, appending to that answer, what do you think about uh, the question here is expanding the members of the court, expanding the size of the court? No, I won't give it. I won't give it. I won't give a uh, definite answer because that's such a political answer and so forth. But I, I have to stay away from real politics because, uh, you know, you're a judge and people may think you're trying to give advice to a court or somebody else in un under circumstances where you haven't thoroughly thought it through and take care and so forth. So that's why there's an ethical rule of stay away from political answers, even for me, who am still a judge, uh, though I don't serve on the Supreme Court. And uh, of course, with many of these things that are proposed, this will help, that will help. If one can play, so can two. And as soon as you think of that fact, uh, you may be a little worried. Yes, I'm not sure that always numbers are the right answer. How about this? I mean, this is not a political uh, question. It is about advice. What's the best advice you received? What's the best advice you would give? And would it be different if it were given to a lawyer? Advice about what? Now, I can give you some advice generally. I mean, uh, uh, being on the court, I got advice from somebody saying, listen to younger people and listen to artists because they're in touch with younger people and see where things are going. That wasn't so bad. But my father gave me two pieces of advice that I tell the students uh, before he died. And, and I, I say they were pretty good. And uh, one of them uh, was uh, because they want to know, what do you do to get on the Supreme Court? I say, I don't know. What you do is you do your best. And some, that's what my father said, when you have a job to do, do it as well as you can and listen to other people. And if you listen and talk to other people and you do your job as well as you can, well, someone may notice and you may get a better job. On the other hand, they might not notice, but then you have at least the satisfaction of knowing you've put your best out and you've done the best you can, and that's a reward. Okay, what was his best advice my father gave me? Number one, that was number two. You wanna know what number one was, remember? Yeah, number one was stay on the payroll. <laughs> yeah. Always good advice, mm -hmm. wise, practical, pragmatic, one would say. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the biggest threat to democracy? The biggest threat is what I tell the, I, I'd say I, when, when I talk to the high school students or whatever, they say, what should we do? The country's in such a mess. I say, hey, my friend, it's not up to me now. It's up to you. You're the ones that have to figure it out. And if I can say one thing, I say, I hope uh, as uh, when I say at a graduation, I hope you find someone to love. I hope you find a good job. And I hope above all that you will participate in public life. Because if you do not participate in public life, this won't work because it assumes you will. This is the constitution here. It assumes you will. And uh, uh, yeah, at least vote. At least go out and talk to people sometimes who don't agree with you. At least remember Senator Kennedy's advice when you talk to those people who say, it's not all you doing all the talking all the time. Find out what they think. The more they talk, the better. The more you're likely to, they'll say something. You say, I actually agree with that. And once you say, ah, oh, I actually agree with that, then maybe you can work with it. And maybe you can come somewhere, get somewhere. But listening, hey, 
this country has been good at some things, informing groups of people. We just had groups of people going around to old people during COVID to see if they were okay, to see if they, if they had enough food. Uh, and and, and uh, that happened in San Francisco. It happened in, in Cambridge, Mass. It happened all over the place. And we're fairly good at getting groups of people together and trying to have a project and trying to see that that project works, whether it's a better school or a better park or um, a better football game or something. We're fairly good at getting together and do it. So get out there and don't sit around and complain <laughs> and get out there and talk to people you disagree with so we can get on maybe a little bit better. And uh, that's, that's the advice I usually give. Those are wise words for all three branches of government, state and local and communities and families, as you have pointed out. I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about what seems to be on the minds of all folks here, particularly in San Francisco, your um, hometown, your favorite son. And that is, in what way do you think artificial intelligence can benefit access to justice, law itself, any concerns or I ideas about artificial intelligence and the world of law? I don't know that. I'm not a computer expert. You have them all in San Francisco. So I don't, I do know, I asked, uh, we went to a, uh, uh, a dinner at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. My wife is a psychologist and she worked at Dana-Farber with, with children who had cancer in their families. And uh, uh, I was talking to some of the scientists there because they're always at work trying to find cures. And they thought uh, artificial intelligence helped. They thought it helped uh, produce masses of data through which you had a better chance of discovering why this kind of person who had apparently the same uh, kind of lung cancer that some other person have nonetheless didn't get it and why the other person did get it and what were the characteristics. And they had a lot of ways that they used it. So because I talked to him, I'm pretty enthusiastic about the way at Dana-Farber they're using um, artificial intelligence. But you'll have to tell me how AI would work in the legal community, I don't know. I think we're still figuring out what it means, its definition in the legal community. And I think you've even spoken to it. We're worried a little bit about the ethics of it and mm. trying to determine what that means. Um, I wanted to ask you also about any views on uh, the way judges are uh, elected and or lifetime appointments. No, oh, there are Sandra and Tony, uh, Sandra O'Connor, Tony Kennedy, and I, and David. Most of us have spoken about it, and, and we think it's not such a good idea, and there are compromises. There's the Missouri plan, there's the Alaska plan. Uh, but the danger of it is, of course, that a person who is before such a judge on a criminal charge or some other charge will fear that that judge is being moved by political considerations, uh, maybe even uh, campaign contributions or something, and there is a risk in that. But Lee Campbell, who was my colleague at the First Circuit for many years, told me a judge is a person who has a powerful uh, position on certain narrow issues. And when he starts to express his view on other issues, the lawyers all say, oh, that's very interesting, Judge. But they go outside and tell each other, well, there he goes again. <laughs> because I'm not sure, although we've said many times that we're not delighted with the, and see many flaws in, in an elected judicial system, uh, I haven't seen it changing too much. And there we are. Thank you. That's, I know that that's a question that has um, been in front of the media. And it's mm -hmm. wonderful to hear a voice like yours speak to the point of that. I wanted to ask you if you had any advice for practitioners, those lucky lawyers who have the opportunity to have an argument in front of the United States Supreme Court. No, my, my, brother, my brother is a district court, federal district judge in San Francisco. And he says, it's great being a federal district judge. You hear trials and you can decide the way you think. You don't have to pay attention to eight colleagues who may disagree with you when you know you're right and they're wrong. Okay. But, uh, 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 when, I, when I think about uh, the court itself, I'd like lawyers, particularly lawyers, I would like lawyers to know how the Supreme Court works. And I'd like them to read this because I'd like them to go to the newspapers and them go on law day, say, to public schools or other schools and, and explain their own lives to the students and how law works for them and how it works for their clients. I think it's important to do that. And of course, the obvious thing, if they're arguing in the Supreme Court, which is a very difficult job, 
very difficult because you don't know what questions you'll get. And you have to listen to the question. And I got this advice from Mike Berman, who I'm sorry died recently, but he helped me in my confirmation. And he said, all you need to remember is what I, as a trial lawyer, that's Berman, would tell my client if he's a witness. One, listen to the question. Two, take your time. You don't have to meet some deadline. Think about what you're going to say. And three, answer the question. He said, you do that in your confirmation hearing. Listen to the question. Think about what you're going to say and answer it. And remember, you're not there to show your intelligence. Or you're there to get confirmed. Okay? So you answer that question, fine, and they'll move on completely. And then the, the uh, senator will move on to the next question. And you do the same. And you do the same. And pretty soon he'll finish. And then you'll move to the next senator. And after a while, you'll have all 17 asking the questions they want to ask, and you'll have answered them completely, and so they'll be finished, and then you will be confirmed. That was his advice. It was pretty good. That's advice. It's good advice. It sounds so um, simple to follow. Well, it's not so simple to do. But, no, exactly. Yeah. In practice, it might seem quite difficult. I wonder if you might share with us the, um, the story of how your, uh, you had an interview with President Clinton and uh, you had suffered a mishap a few days prior to that meeting. Yeah, I had a bicycle accident. I had a bicycle accident. I, I think I did something to my lung and I had a tube in it. And um, so that was going on at the time. And I understand that you, notwithstanding those physical uh, challenges, met with the president, I guess, and the rest is history for us. Yeah, it was noble. I mean, that was when he selected Ruth Ginsburg. So when, when people from the press would ask me, I mean, I know Ruth, and I knew her before. I thought she was a good judge. I mean, if you're honest and you're in sort of the finals in something like that, you know perfectly well there are at least four or five or maybe 50 or 60 who are equally qualified. And beyond being considered, which I thought was uh, uh, something that suggested I'd done a fairly good job, and so I was pleased with that. And it's, it's, it's up not to me. It's up to the president. And he was the one who decided that the two of us would be appointed. He appointed me the next year. He appointed Ruth that year. And you think I'm going to say those were bad appointments? I don't think so. <laughs> I'm a little biased. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, would you mind sharing with us why, how and why you made the decision uh, to leave the bench in 2022? There, there, there are, um, to decide to retire is hard. That's why retirement age is sometimes, as most countries have it, a little bit easier. But I mean, I was about close to, I was about 83 years old two years ago. I'm 85 now. You're going to have to retire sometime. I've been there for 28 years. <laughs> and there are other people who might like a chance too. And you have to figure out what's going to happen in the court in the future. You don't know. And so there are many, many factors that go in and taking them all into account and asking my family and various others and so forth. I thought this is the time rather than wait a year, wait two years, who knows, et cetera. Along those same lines and in just the few minutes that we have left, I only have a few more questions. But I wonder if uh, in your storied history career, that there are any cases in particular that you still think about? I don't think about too. what Sanders said, which is true, is you d decide and then you move on. You see, the interest of a judge compared to a law professor, they're both interesting jobs, but the, the professors and the scholars are primarily interested in the past and what has happened. Primarily, they're also. But a, a judge also has to be interested in the present and the future. And how this is what happened in the past and what the issue is in the present and how the future might work. You never know for sure. You never know for sure. And, and that's hard, but it's a very interesting thing to do and uh, challenging. And, and I think that's the part that I rather like. Are the mistakes that I made in the past? I'm sure I did. I'm sure I did. But uh, it's on to the next one.
I was a professor first. That was the first part of my career, just about. I clerked for Arthur Goldberg. And he would have said, first of all, we'd lose a case when he was on the court, and I'd be annoyed or upset and say, how could they decide this the other way that we wrote? We're so right. <laughs> and he'd say, what do you want me to do about it? He'd say, am I supposed to sit here and just complain uh, or cry or something? No, it's on to the next case. And let's see if we can do better. What, um, what compelled you to become a, a jurist? And you had a career where you did clerk and then you worked in Congress for the Judiciary Committee and you were a special- Well, the vacancy on the First Circuit came up and uh, um, there, there was a vacancy and it, it turned out that um, we wanted Archie Cox actually, the staff and Kennedy and no, he was, uh, the president said he was, thought he was too old to do it. I don't know, whatever. But uh, that didn't work out. And then they were running short and President Reagan, the Republican, was going to be elected. And so they thought they better find somebody fast. There I was, <laughs> right, right, right on the spot. So uh, Senator Kennedy did suggest to President Clinton that, uh, to uh, uh, President Carter that he nominate me for that job. And I thought it would be a very interesting job. And I was right. I mean, for the job on the First Circuit. Right. So 14 years there and 28 years on the United States Supreme Court. Do you miss any piece of this? Sure. Of course. I found it a very interesting and worthwhile job. You're helping people. It's like being a lawyer. You have a client. I tell that to the college students. They say, what's so good about law? I say, I'm not saying it's so good. I'm just saying this. You have a brain and you have a heart. And if you want to be a good lawyer, you better have a a good brain too, and not everyone does. Don't tell anyone I said that, but, but you do. And uh, a heart, everybody has that. And so you need both. And that makes it a pretty interesting job. And you have someone to help that client. Yes, yes. And it's gratifying, as you pointed out, mm -hmm. and it's rewarding. Uh, this book you've already mentioned, you started off by talking about why you wrote this book. And I love that you started off by saying when you speak to fifth graders and you gave a very tangible example of snails on the train versus animals. And then also in our discussion, you've talked about when you speak to judges and lawyers, and I know you've taught abroad as well. This book uh, helps people, lawyers, the public, students understand the uh, approach, the judicial approaches to the work, the important work and the complicated work that's being done. Um, and you've already said, and I agree, you would like all judges to read this and lawyers too, I presume lawyers are those. I think that, that students and others ought to know how the courts work. They don't have to, but if they're at all interested in this government of the United States of America, it's one part of it. And I, I think it's helpful to know. I've tried to write it in a way that a person who's not a judge uh, and not a lawyer can understand it. Now, I don't say it takes and take work. It takes a little work, <laughs> but uh, uh, they can understand it. Well, I would also found it a pleasure uh, to not only read it, but to listen to it on Audible. It mm -hmm. feels like a certain special privilege to have you read it uh, in your own words and to hear that it's a true privilege. And mm -hmm. in our in our moments left, I wanted to ask you just as a highlight, if what, what would you like to tell this audience and what are some takeaways from the book that you would like them to know about and take away from this long ranging conversation? The judges there, like most of them, are most of the time trying to do their job. They disagree about the way that they're trying to do it. And they don't always do it perfectly, but that's true of human nature. That's true of human beings and they're trying. And I'd like them to see what the law is about and why this constitution is important to them and why it matters that it encapsulates certain human rights and why we have to, above all, look, I can put this another way. What? I found letters where Washington wrote to a friend of his, this country we founded is an experiment. My wife said to our grandchildren, $20 for any of you who memorize the Gettysburg Address. Why? For, listen to this, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation conceived in liberty 
and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. We are now engaged in a great war to see whether this nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. You see what he's saying? It's an experiment, my friends. Those people over in France, the Lumieres of the Scottish Enlightenment up there, they have a great theory that involves liberty, that involves democracy, that involves human rights and so forth. But remember, they're a little bit like academics and they know it's a theory. And maybe in the back of their mind, there's going, ah, yeah, yeah, it's a theory. It's a great theory, but they'll never do it. That USA will never really be able to put it into practice. Remember those imaginary words. And remember Washington and Lincoln thinking, yes, we can. Yes, we can. We'll show them. And that experiment continues today. And that experiment continues in the form that you have to listen. You don't have to, but maybe you'll try to listen and understand people who disagree with you. So all those things I think are important to maintaining what is really, I shouldn't say it, it's bragging, but an admirable form of government that we've created in the United States of America. Justice Breyer, you have done our democracy and our rule of law a great favor in writing a book like this and how you have written it in a way that is understandable by layperson or lawyer or appellate justice. And I think that it's also a kind of book that is timeless. But I, I do hope that uh, people read it early and understand better as the decisions of the United States Supreme Courts are made, but also for all the states, trial courts, Court of Appeal justices and Supreme Court justices in all 50 states and territories reads this. Many of them will see themselves and many will also think of and find a new approach. Thanks to the time and consideration you have taken to write this book. Our thanks to Justice Stephen Breyer, author of Reading the Constitution, Why I Chose Pragmatism, Not Textualism. We encourage everyone to pick up a copy of Justice Breyer's new book at your local bookstore. And if you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual and in-person programming possible, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash events. Thank you, sir. This has been an engaging conversation. The Commonwealth thanks you for your time, sir. Thank you. I'm Tani Kantil Saka'ue. Thank you and take care.